right, well, let's get started here. Um, we're going to talk now a little bit some some of the high points in the first section of uh, Isaiah. So, first section, chapters 1 through 12, some of the high points we've already talked about. I'm going to go back and pick up the uh, Isaiah's calling or his commissioning in Isaiah chapter 6. Um, you see, it's interesting that the prophet Isaiah, it's a, a really neat place to go and kind of camp out for a while in your own quiet time maybe, but with the vision that Isaiah receives of God on his throne and the glory of God and the really it's that heavenly, heavenly tabernacle that he's got this vision of, as an overflow of that comes the calling or the commissioning. And in chapter uh, 6, I'll start reading there in verse 8, after the part we've already read. Um, this response, though, to the holiness of, of the Lord, right? He touched my mouth with it. He said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and in iniquity is taken away, and your sins are forgiven. Then he hears a voice of the Lord saying in verse 8, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? There's the plural of majesty. Sometimes you see us referring to the to the king, but in, in designating Yahweh as king of a plural of majesty, it's not uncommon. Uh, we saw that in uh, all the way back in Genesis chapter uh, 11, uh, where the the re divine response to the rebellion at the Tower of Babel: "Come, let us uh, go and check out what's going on. Come, let us, you know, scatter their their ability to cooperate." And um, uh, so that's what we see there. So that's the plural of majesty. Reference. Um, then I said, here am I, send me, Isaiah's response. And he said, go and tell this people, how's this for a call to ministry? Keep on listening. Go and tell this people. Well, let's talk about who these people are that I'm calling you to go to, Isaiah. Keep on listening, but they don't perceive. They keep on look, looking, but they don't understand. Render their hearts of this people insensitive. Their ears are dull and their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and repent or return and be healed. Then I said, Isaiah says, Lord, how long? And he answered, Till cities are devastated and without inhabitants, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. So there's this kind of this picture that the Lord's unrelenting commitment to his people, even in the midst of the rebellion, all the way up to, we'll see, if the Lord has to ex exile his people, the Lord is willing uh, and able to do that. But um, So let's uh, see. Uh, Isaiah 66. Um, one of the things I wanted to emphasize a little bit here, I'm, I'm backtracking now, is in verse 3. Here's the designation, the, the language that's used in Isaiah's vision, and one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. There's this sense of, uh, with the prophet Isaiah, this ongoing, you know, part of his revelation for the messages that he's going to convey. All is foundational and rests upon this, this designation. Three times God is holy, um, Kind of takes us back to uh, Exodus chapter uh, uh, 24. Let's take a look there. God who's revealing himself to his people. Exodus 24. Um, so a similar um, thing happens with uh, the revelation that God gives not only Moses, but the people of Israel, and this reference to the to the you know the essence of who God is, His glory, His holiness, and the glory of the Lord in verse sixteen rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days, and on the seventh day He called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. So again, it's kind of you know kind of represents the beginning point, right, for uh, God uh, and, and His involvement with His people. And eventually we see that God's glory moving into the temple or the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. Let's turn over there, Exodus 40. 
chapter 40, verse 34. And the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle, so much so that Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting, because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So this is the permanent, um, the, the temporary location for God's presence amongst his people, that ongoing remembrance. And then we have, you know, God with us in Isaiah. So there's some similarities there. Eventually, we see, and I'm back to Isaiah now, chapter 40. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it really quick. Where's this uh, going in terms of Isaiah? And we have in chapter 40, verse 5. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there's a central theme, you might say, to Isaiah's message as it reflects on the glory of the Lord, which started with his call or his commission to ministry, his prophetic ministry, all foundational and rests on the, the glory of the Lord. Um, so that's important. Um, and we talked about this back to his his commissioning and his call, uh, chapter 6, verse 5, and the reference there, or the recognition of um, what, what Isaiah does in response. Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, right? The Lord of hosts. Yahweh is his name. And that goes back to Moses. Uh, remember we talked about Genesis, after God is, is, is identified as Elohim by name, capital G-O-D, God creates, God establishes the foundations for all life. And then we have the transition to chapter 2, verse 4. And then Moses says, in the day that Yahweh God made the heavens and the earth. So the introduction there, for the very first time in scripture, we have the identity of Yahweh, the covenant name for God, introduced to Israel in the same vein as God in his activity as creator. So Moses is saying theological foundation number one, lesson number one is God as creator, you met him at Mount Sinai. He's also Yahweh. You met him by name. He's the one who, who falls on the mountain and introduces himself to you by name. So these are kind of some overlapping themes. And then we move into you know chapter 7 uh, and what we looked at there at the beginning in verse 10 um, with regards to the, to the vision that the, Lord, uh, the prophet Isaiah receives in, in the vein of encouraging the king Ahaz. And, um, and there in verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will be giving you a sign. And here it is. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, or God with us, I'd like to change it up a little bit based on what we've just heard from the prophet Isaiah. It's not only God with us, but it's God as king with us. Um, that's really what I think we can unpack the name and what it means there. So chapter, uh, some other high points here we have in chapter 8. Um, let's see. Let's move on to the next uh, chapter there in chapter 9. Let's look at this a little bit. Chapter 8 there, we're really going to focus on judgment. Um, I'll go back and look at verse 9 and 10 as an example. Um, the prophet says, Be broken, O peoples, and, and be shattered, and give ear all remote places of the earth. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Go ahead, devise a plan. But it will be thwarted. Go ahead, state a proposal. But it's not going to stand. Why? There's the Emmanuel. God is with us. You see that again? There in verse, uh, verse 10. So God with us, the name Emmanuel, can mean, you know, encouragement in one, to one audience, but uh, here we have a different audience that's being addressed. The same name, God with us, Emmanuel, um, means judgment. Um, in other words, that's not a name that you mess with. God's with us means nothing that you do in terms of trying to come up with a scheme against him is going to be successful. So while chapter 8 is focusing on judgment, what's interesting, we just turn one page over, we have one of the most beautiful 
and greatest promises of salvation found anywhere. Chapter 9, beginning in verse 2. Let's see, who am I going to pick on now? All right, Ben. <laughs> Who's got the pizza back there, or the hot dog, or whatever? Get it. So chapter 9. Let's start reading in verse 1 until I tell you to stop there. Uh, but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish in earlier times. He treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea. On the other side of the Jordan, Galilee, of the Gentiles. Uh, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, they, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness of harvest. Men rejoice when they divide the spoil. You shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders. The rod of their oppressor as the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle of tumult, and a cloak rolled in blood, will be burning, fuel for fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness, from then on and forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So you see that the beginning of the picture that starts to be, you know, filled in with vivid color. This is a kingdom that's coming, and you, you know, we've got a few songs, right, pulling from this passage, and songs that are have been written about this in celebration. But you've got a lot of things going on in a passage like this. Um, names for God and who this who this King who's coming, his names, his identity is starting to fill in, and you've got the here a reference to King David, and what's that from? Why would he even talk about David at a point like this, right? Is that me? Oh, it sounded good though. I thought it might have been. Um, let's turn back. Let's turn back and at least try to to make draw some connections to uh, why uh, Isaiah would be referencing on the throne of David and over his kingdom. Don't forget the. Davidic covenant, right? You remember that? We, we talked about that last spring. Let's turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and just remind ourselves together. 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Don't be confused with 1 Samuel. Let's just pick up here with uh, Nathan's oracle to King David. Let's start with verse 10, and uh, let's have Ian read now. Chapter 7, verse 10. Got it? Um, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. No, I say, uh, 2 Samuel 7, verse 10. I will appoint, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them. Read a little louder so everybody can hear you. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more. As Keep going. Uh, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you will lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish a kingdom. You shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, and in accordance 
with all their decision to Okay, good. So that's the Davidic covenant, and we know that we would expect somewhere or someone to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, um, when are we going to anticipate this uh, fulfillment? When are we going to see um, this, this kingdom established? And, and when are we going to expect the one to come on the scene to, to make it all happen? So we're going to start to see this uh, unpacked by the prophets, like Isaiah here in chapter 7. So uh, <clears throat> um, this reference to King David and this, this idea of the this is going to be a future house or a future throne, a future temple that's going to be established. Um, so that's what we have going on here, this reference. But it's all wrapped up with this, this idea of... Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking in the wrong place. Over here. Yes, the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. So this is a kingdom that's coming. Um, critical scholars will you know, have a little bit of difficulty at junctures like this. I mean, how, again, do you have one chapter, chapter 8, devoted to judgment, and the next chapter, just around the corner here, seemingly focusing on hope for the future and encouragement. That seems a little inconsistent, doesn't it? So they'll even try to, you know, maybe break down you know, this can't come from the same author kind of uh, song again. Uh, but the problem is, you know, it's, we said earlier that the author, you know, these are prophets who are addressing two audiences, and they can do this simultaneously. You know, they can have one message intended for the unfaithful majority. That's judgment. But you guys in the middle, you need to be encouraged you've not given up or you know that you've been walking faithfully and the message for you is hope, hope for the future. The promises that God's made, the unconditional promises, for example, King David, the everlasting kingdom, guess what? That's going to be your future home. There's a spot for you there. So that's important for you to hear and to be encouraged and to be reminded of. So the prophets will speak you know, tenderly to the faithful minority to the faithful remnant, we might say, because of the future and what the future holds for them. Um, this will be a day of the coming, you know, when, when we're hearing from the King of Kings. It's also going to involve the nations of the world. Um, chapter 9, verse 7. Um, let's see. This is going to be an extension to the whole world. Um, this is going to be become this this idea of the this future or this new restored Jerusalem and a future king who's going to come. Um, so we make connections like this, and what I like to to remind myself of is there are these pointers to the future all over the place. And remember, I talked about I think I did with y'all how the the Hebrew Bible ends. Do you remember that conversation? Remember the last book of the Hebrew Bible is Second Chronicles. And if we turn there to Second Chronicles chapter 36 and look and read the very last word, which is a portion of the Cyrus decree, verse 23, chapter 36. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He's appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem which is in Judea, Judah, whoever there is among you of all of his people, may the Lord, his God, be with them and let him go up. So there's this return to Jerusalem idea that we, we have hardwired into the Hebrew canon and the way that it ends. Let him go up as an invitation to the faithful remnant, wherever they might be, and also to all of the nations to go up to Zion, that is the new Jerusalem, and do what? Meet and worship the king. We turn to Isaiah chapter 2. We have this coming through in the Isaiah, some of the early portions of the encouraging words to the uh, chapter 2. Let's start reading in verse 2. Let's see. Could Kristen, could you read for us back here? Isaiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. It 
It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountains of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. Yeah, one more verse. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of, uh, of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his path. Uh, for out of Zion uh, shall, uh, shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we've, we've looked at this before. It's just by way of reminder. But notice in verse 2, there at the end it involves the nations. Um, it's not just the faithful remnant now. This day of the Lord, this return to Zion, to the highest of mountains, is a place where they're going to go and, and be involved in the activity of, of the king who sits on his throne. And the uh, teaching of the Torah, the return to covenant obedience and all of these things. So this is the picture of the future that uh, is also foundational to the prophet Isaiah. So this idea of let him go up. I think he's a precursor and the chronicler, the historian, who is encouraging those exiles who have come back, is picking up on these themes from these early prophets like Isaiah, and we'll see Micah has the same section of text repeated with this focus on let him go up. So here again, uh, chapter 11, let's turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 11. And here's a significant theological, again, a, a, a reference back to... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll argue the Davidic uh, covenant here. Let's turn, uh, let's see. Kelsey, could you read for us? Um, let's see, where do I want you to read? Beginning in chapter 11, verse 1. Okay. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and the child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, the young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the utter, adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay. Well, we've got here a vivid description of the king who's coming, and more particularly what he'll do. So his job description. Um, you see in verse 2, so the stump or st you know, the reference to Jesse, the father of King David, so it's stemming from, again, the Davidic covenant. But now we've got more vivid color in, of the picture of, of filling in of who this one will be coming from the Davidic line to be, come back to be king. So we've got verse 2. He'll be established. The Spirit of the Lord will remain on him to establish wisdom and knowledge. Verses 4 through 5. What will he do? He'll establish righteousness and justice. What else will he do? Verses 6 through 9 and all that language of the lion laying down with the lamb. It's this picture of peace. He'll establish peace. Um, he'll extend shalom to the whole world. He'll extend blessing to the nations, verse 10. Um, finally, what we'll see in verse 10, um, we didn't read it, but it'll come about on that day that nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for all the peoples, and his resting place will, will be glorious. Do you remember the Abrahamic covenant? One of the things that was promised that... Uh, we go all the way back to Genesis 12 and verse 3. One of the things that was mentioned. The Lord himself will bless those who bless you, Israel. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, or through you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. 
see that we're finally seeing the fulfillment of the when will the blessing be extended to all of the nations? So it's coming up. It's just around the corner, according to Isaiah. Um, and it's coming through this one who, who will extend blessing to the nations, according to verse 10. And finally, uh, verse 11 through 12. Um, sorry, I was jumping ahead here. There we go. Verse Chapter 11, verse 11. Then it will happen on that day, this is the day of the Lord, that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand, the remnant of his people who will remain from all of the nations of the earth, Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Alam, Shinar, Hamath, from the islands of the sea. What will he do? Well, he'll lift them up, a standard for the nations. And he uh, and will assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Do you think that would be encouraging to you all in the center of the room? the faithful remnant. So really, wherever you are, the Lord will find you. You happen to be around at the time that the day of the Lord is ushered in. And you'll be brought in um, from wherever you're exiled. So that's an encouraging uh, message as well. All right, well, let's keep moving here. Chapters 13 through 27. Um, and we've seen this with some of the other prophets like Amos. Remember the prophet Amos started with a section like this, judgment against nations, or the nations around. So we have judgments here against Babylon, the Philistines, Moabites, uh, the Syrians, Damascus, Ethiopia, the Egyptians, and its allies, uh, and all of that. We saw that with the Amos chapter 1. We'll see it again in Ezekiel. It's going to have a similar passage. Jeremiah is going to have a similar passage. But it's really the primary concern, and it's a, a, a continual thread. All of the prophets are going to have this concern for God's, God's concern for the nations, uh, God's concern for justice uh, and righteousness for the whole world. So that's interesting. Isaiah 22, as you can see, specifically focuses on Jerusalem. And here's some, some uh, particular details. Let's turn there. Isaiah chapter 22. And... Uh, <clears throat> Let's see, Bridget, could you read for us in chapter 22, verses 6 through 8? You have that? Okay. And Elam wore the quiver and chari with chariots and horsemen, and her uncovered the shield. Joseph's valleys were full of chariots, and the horsemen took their stand at the gate. He has taken away the covering of Judah. In that day, you looked to the weapons of the house of the forest, and you saw that the breaches of the city of David were made. Okay. Oh, and go ahead. Go ahead. The waters of the lower pool. So we've kind of looked at this before. You remember, this is the, the section where um, here's the, uh, the Sennacherib crisis. This is de describing and right on top of the mounting pressure that the Assyrians are bringing down from the north. And if we continue on and read in verses 8 through 11, here's the reference to King Hezekiah, the reinforcing of the wall, and the establishing of the tunnel, the Siloam tunnel that brings the water in from the Siloam pool. Remember, the Isaiah question here is, who are you trusting in uh, here, King Hezekiah? The Lord or yourself? You know, Verses 22, if we, if we scroll down, Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. And I will drive him uh, like a peg in a firm place, and he will become a throne of glory to his father's house. So here again, we see that in the end for Judah, God's promise to King David will have everlasting implications. So we go back and forth between uh, the prophetic message has relevance for the current situation, but also every now and then we have glimpses of, of breaking out into future Day of the Lord language. And uh, we have that in chapters 28 through 28 through 35, or the developing idea of, of this new and righteous king that's going to emerge in Jerusalem. Chapter 32 and 33 describe the king in the midst of the text. Uh, we have this picture of the king emerging, going back and forth between sections that focus on judgment and also sections that focus on, on salvation. Let's take a look at just a few examples 
chapter 32. Um, let's see here. Stephen, up here, could you start reading there in, in verse 1? The righteous kingdom announced. Indeed, a king will reign justly, and rulers will rule justly. Each will be like a shelter from the wind, a refuge from the rain, like streams of water in a dry land, in the shade of, of a massive rock in an arid land. Okay, you can just pause there. So that first verse there, verse 1, the first part there is announcing the king... But in the midst of judgment the Lord, of the Lord, we see glimpses that the Lord will be exalted as he establishes his rule. Let's move over to verse chapter 33. Go ahead and read verses 5 through 10. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. There will be times of security for you, storehouse of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. Listen, their warriors cry loudly in the streets. The messengers of peace weep bitterly. The highways are deserted. Travel has ceased. An agreement has been broken. Cities despised. And human life disregarded. The land mourns and withers. Lebanon is ashamed and decayed. Sharon is like a desert. Bashan and Caramel shake off their leaves. Now I will rise up, says the Lord. Now I will lift myself up. Now I will be exalted. Move down to verse 20 and 22, and let's pick up that. 20 and 22, in that same chapter. Look at Zion, the city of our festival times. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a peaceful pasture, a tent that does not wander. Its tent pegs will not be pulled up, nor will any of its cords be loosened. For there will be... For the one, for the for there, the majestic one, the Lord will be for us a place of rivers and broad streams, where ships are rowed and will not go, and majestic vessels will not pass. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. Your ropes are slack; they cannot hold the base of the mast or spread out the flag. Then abundant spoil will be divided, the land will plunder it, and none there will say, I am sick. The people who dwell there will be forgiven their iniquity. Okay, so there's a lot going on, obviously. One thing I want to point out here in verse 20. Look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. Um, there's an interesting connection I want to make there with uh, some of the development that goes on in um, Zechariah. Let's turn to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. And right at the end of the prophet Zechariah, he too will focus on the uh, day of the Lord. Uh, in the first uh, verse there in chapter 14, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord. And spoil will be taken. Though it's going to be judgment. And then in verse 9, And then the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. And what, is, what else happens on the day of the Lord? What's interesting is, over here in verse 16, chapter 14, then it will be, or that, then it will come about, that anyone who's left among the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up, there's the emphasis of going up from year to year, to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and what? To celebrate the Feast of Booths. So this focus that Isaiah places on the appointed feast in Zion, it's interesting that they come back around. The, one of the emphasis of the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles is the, the focus that Israel put on their remembrance of God who was victorious, bringing and helping and getting his people out of Egypt. To celebrate the Feast of Booths also meant to focus on God as king, and to sit around and, and have, a, you know, it's a, it's a celebration and bringing in the, the, the best of the produce to bring in the orphan and the widow and the alien and stranger were, really, were also involved in helping to celebrate this day. What's also interesting is it's Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem occurred during the time 
of the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. We read about that in John chapter 7. So it's an interesting connection how one seemingly unimportant celebration or feast, the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, it's originally developed and taught by Moses, practiced by Israel, but also picked up as a significant feast or time of celebration by the prophets in anticipation of the coming of the day of the Lord, which, by the way, was first fulfilled in Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. See the connection there? How all those things kind of string together? All right, so that was just a little aside. But this day of the Lord is a celebration, salvation for his people. Um, so let's go back to Isaiah chapter uh, 35, and we see this coming day of the Lord um, will involve a full renewal like a desert being reinvigorated with life and abundance. Let's look at chapter 35 and get some of the details here. Let's see here. Could I have uh, Michael left? He may not have been feeling well. Um, Jen, could you read for us? Chapter 35 in Isaiah, verses 1 and 2. Uh, the desert and the parched land will be glad, and the wine needs will rejoice and the blossom like a crocus. Uh, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly uh, in the shot for joy. The glory of Lebanon and will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and the Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Okay, good. And verse 3, encourage the exhausted. Strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance and recompense of God will come. But he will save you. That's encouraging news. So this is a the coming day of the Lord will be a, a day of renewal, like a desert being reinvigorated. It will mean judgment for your enemies. Um, uh, this judgment comes from a vengeful, vengeful king, according to verse 4. But notice in verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer. And the tongue of the dung will shout for joy, this theme of joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arava or the desert. Um, again, this restoration. Um, the scorched land will become like a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. And the haunt of jackals, its resting place. Grass becomes reeds and rushes. And a highway will be there, a roadway. It will be called the Highway of Holiness. I'd like to see that street sign. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. So, um, got this coming day of the Lord, uh, and it's uh, for for the one who travels on the road to to Zion. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return. Come with joy, joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will, be, uh, they will find gladness and joy. Joy, 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 joy. Let me ask you all this question. What's the difference between happiness and joy? What? Yeah, good. Happiness is in the present, the here and now. This is joy, 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 joy. Where can joy come from for the, maybe, not quite yet, but the group who are wondering about the future? Joy only comes from the Lord. Joy comes from the Lord. Joy comes from the, joy is rooted in the future. Do you see that too? So this is all stuff that's coming around the corner. It's, it's, but that's how we can help, help our folks in, a, in the our pews and our Sunday school classes remind them that this day of the Lord is still future for us, right? We have reason to be joyful. Why? Not because of our present circumstances, but because there's a lot yet to come. The Lord's agenda is is still being unpacked, and it's still future for us. So, you know, uh, happiness is present and temporary. Joy has this future aspect to it, and thus it can be permanent. Future hasn't happened yet. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what about uh, the Lord comes to you when you receive what He's done, doesn't it? The joy of the Lord 
you can access now. Oh yeah, I'm just your salvation. I'm just making an observation of how how the prophet here is is reminding his his audience that joy can be experienced because of knowing of what yet's to come. Okay. Not to be hyper focused on your present circumstances, but have things to look forward to. Okay. So something like that. All right, let's keep going here. So um in you might like this from Dr. Smith. Okay. Happiness is an emotion. And joy is an attitude of the heart. Ah, that's good. Yeah, it's the heart that um, is going to connect with, uh, I don't know if you remember my famous heart with feet picture. Absolutely forget. Oh, don't forget. It'll be on your final exam. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the picture of what, what it means to have this authentic faith for the faithful, you and the faithful, the faithful remnant, you know that you've got your heart firmly attached to feet, so it's it's um, you know it's the faith or the trust part of it, plus the obedience or the follow through, and uh, we have this consistent picture starting with Moses, you know, and and throughout the entire scripture, it comes back to, you know, for one who's obedient, they know they they're 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 the faithful remnant. They have feet attached to the heart. It's the trust. But it's the follow-through, and that's the authentic. You know, it's what James talks about in the New Testament. Faith without works is not authentic. It's dead. It's not real. It's not authentic. So that's the, that's the consistent picture that we have. So the faithful remnant at any time in history know they have this day of the Lord promise. And uh, whenever we read prophets, it's always amazing if you've not spent a lot of time in prophets lately, it's pervasive. It's everywhere. It's this encouragement that's continually coming to the to the faithful remnant. Now, Isaiah chapter thirty six through thirty nine, interestingly, uh, word for word is really coming from, and it's a parallel account from Second Kings chapter eighteen, beginning in verse thirteen, all the way through chapter twenty, verse twenty one, and it's going to deal with the Sennacherib crisis and the historical events in, around, in and surrounding Isaiah's prophetic ministry, um, uh, his, his, his prophetic ministry and encouragement to King Hezekiah. So we've already talked about the, here's another picture of the Hezekiah's wall. We already looked at the um, inscription from the uh, Sennacherib prison here in reference to King uh, Hezekiah himself like a caged bird shut up in Jerusalem. His royal city, um, and this is what Sennacherib would boast about upon his return. Um, of course, his return was also met with <laughs> his premature death, and then, uh, and then um, so that's what we have there. Now, let's continue to move on. So, chapter forty. Remember, in terms of the three Isaiahs, this would become kind of a breaking point. So, just kind of log that away. Um, we go to chapter 40, and we leave the historical narrative section, and then we go back into poetic or um, the, kind of the, um, the uh, parallel, par uh, the poetic section here with regards to a, uh, an initial message from the prophet Isaiah. What is interesting about the prophet Isaiah is that he never speaks of or refers to the fall of Jerusalem. Um, it's not in it's not in the the book of Isaiah. Um, so, what he's going to do, though, in this section, I would argue, is anticipate an exilic group who needs encouragement. They're grieving. So, if you're in now exile, we have to kind of think in three dimensions here. The prophet Isaiah is anticipating some things about this exilic group. Let's say the faithful remnant. <coughs> You're in Babylon. What would the prophet Isaiah need to say to you? So you're grieving. You've lost your temple. You've lost your king. You've lost your land. You've ceased to exist as a nation. You've lost loved ones along the way. And now you're in a foreign territory. And uh, things are starting to happen in your world. Your world's been turned upside down. What are the kinds of things that the prophet Isaiah might have in store for you? So one of the things that is, is really true is that you're grieving. Um, you've suffered trauma 
all of these modern terms. Um, you know, the same God who turned us... It's interesting, you remember what God did against the Assyrian king Sennacherib, but God didn't do that for the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. So what's the question? Can God save us? Will he, will he save us? Does God even want to save us again? So what's our future? Um, so Isaiah chapter 40 through 55 it's going to address those questions and answer some of those questions with a resounding yes. Yes, yes, yes to the exiles in Babylon. You're going to have a future. The exile will have a limit to it, and you have a place to go and a future to go to. So let's chat, take a look at the beginning here in chapter 40. You see the very first word, right? Comfort. Oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem. Call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low and let, let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Down through verse 5. Then, what will happen then? Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So we start to see this uh, message coming right out. Right out of the heavenly court. The returning king, he's introduced and described. As well as what this returning king will accomplish. Um, let's see. Um, let's go back to the very first page. Let's pick up with... Uh, Trevor's not here tonight. Damien, over here. Chapter 40, let's start reading in verse 9. 9 through 14. Zion, herald of good news, go up on a high mountain in Jerusalem. Herald of good news, raise your voice loudly. Raise it. Do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See the Lord God comes with strength, and his power establishes his rule. His reward is with him, and his gifts accompany him. He protects his flocks like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms, and he carries them in the folds of his garment. He gently leads those that are missing. Who has measured the waters and hollowed out his hand, or marked off the heavens with the span of his hand? Who has gathered the dust of the earth and a measure or weigh the mountains in a balance and the hills in the scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Who has gave him his counsel? Who did he consult with? Who gave him his understanding and taught him the paths of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Okay, that's great. And he continues on. This is a great passage. It's chapter 40. Do you not know, in verse 21... Have you not heard? Has it been not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the vault of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out, uh, stretches out the heavens like a curtain and stretches them out like a tent to dwell in. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing and makes the judges of the earth meaningless. So you've got this very... Uh, active description of the king who's coming in, in all of his glory. Verses uh, 28 uh, down through 31. Do you not know, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Encouragement for you all? Does it sound encouraging to you? Yeah, absolutely. If you're in exile... Though the youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not get tired. They'll walk and not become weary. So this is all the returning king is described uh, to a group. They're down, they're discouraged, they're grieving. But this is all intended to encourage them and get them oriented to the future. Um, sometimes we all need to take a step back and be reminded ourselves, don't we? God's on his throne. He's, and, that's 
to where he is now, and he's coming again. Um, so just like, I think we're invited to understand, you know, we are somewhat in an exilic situation ourselves. We talk about heaven. Heaven is our home, but the new earth, the new, new heavens are coming down, uh, and God's returning as king. So that's an encouraging, encouraging message. Let's keep going here. But the exiles may have had their doubts. Um, that's just a doubting picture. Um, <laughs> and here's where this, it's important to come back to this picture, and this is where this, this idea of predictive prophecy comes in. So we think of Isaiah. How could he pull this off? That's the critical scholars, you know, asking that question. And um, this idea of anticipating the exile and the exiles, those in exile, um, where could Isaiah have had a little bit of foundation in terms of this message? Um, and these are these are important questions. Um, we have one one thing that we know: God is on His throne. So this vantage point of any time Isaiah could write down a message in anticipation of some kind of audience that would have been encouraged by this certainly could have come from the that eternal vantage point that I have, that upper line there. But another thing that's important, Isaiah, Isaiah could have uh, also um, gotten some specific information from um, other places in God's Word. So now he's pulling from places like, I. Um, let's go back to all the way to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 28. And you remember the first theologian, Moses, already laid out the fork in the road. So this exile, this experience of exile, we go all the way back to 28, uh, chapter 28, verse, uh, you know, the curses section of chapter 28. Um, let's read in verse 49. What will happen? The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as an eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance. You shall have no respect for the old, nor, show, nor show, show favor to the young. So this is the conqueror who comes, the nation from afar, from the north, comes down and brings about this exilic experience. It's described here in the remainder of chapter 28. But what would Isaiah also have known from places like Deuteronomy? Well, look at chapter 30. After a period of exile, so it shall be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I've set before you, you'll call them to mind in all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you. Isaiah's reading this. And you repent, you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, then what will the Lord do? The Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you, and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. What is Isaiah doing? He's just filling in the color. He's just filling in the details of what Moses has already laid out. Well, yeah, there's going to be restoration. What's that going to look like? Day of the Lord, fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, this king who comes back and restores, sits on his throne and establishes his kingdom. It's already there, you know? So what the prophet's doing a little divine help, I think, is anticipating this exilic group who needs to have a certain certain short list of questions answered with regards to, well, we're in exile, so we have no land, we've got no king, and we've got no temple. So what does the prophet Isaiah do? He starts to fill in the picture. This restoration idea involves a return to a land with a king who comes, and eventually a temple that will come down and be restored. And this exile will have an ending point. So that's what we're going to begin to see. And interestingly, the prophet Jeremiah, he's going to be the one that comes in and says the exile will end at a particular time. Yeah, go ahead. If the critical scholars have an issue with uh, a single author of, of Isaiah, do they also have an issue with Isaiah's prophecy about the coming Messiah? Um, it seems like they, yeah. they have an issue with... Yeah. How could he know this stuff? So, yeah, they'll, they'll limit the, the extent. 
of the prophetic message at place. At pla it depends on what commentator you pick up and, and read. So this, this again, this idea of limiting the predictive prophecy, the predictive ability for a prophet to hear from the Lord, but the Lord's vantage point. So they're going to limit that, uh, and that's, that's the basic tendency. So I get a little, I mean, I was getting a little excited there. So, you know, for example, what about the no land? The, the idea that the exiles are going to be away from their land. Let's turn to, uh, I'm in Deuteronomy, let's turn back to Isaiah. Actually, what we need to do is take, a, let's take a five-minute break, okay? So go ahead and do what you need to do, five minutes, come back and we'll finish for the home stretch.